right, sorry about that, I got cut off. Um, so what is a gospel? The gospel recounts the life of Jesus of Nazareth and his teaching, um, which formed the foundation of the Christian faith. Several gospels have, have been written by disciples of Jesus during the centuries following his death, but only four were authorized by the Council of Nicaea in 325 for inclusion in the Christian Bible. These four were attributed to St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John. So obviously we'll, we will be looking at <laughs> um, many images that um, are attributed to, um, um, to these four evangelists. With manuscripts, um, we see the continued interlacing pattern we saw with the metalwork. So looking back, let me scroll back a little bit to um, this, the Sutton Hope purse and the fibula. Um, now we're looking at a manuscript and hopefully you can see the connection. You see this sort of, of nodding um, and lacing, um, interlacing of these sort of um, geometric forms. So again, but it's, it's interwoven and depicting a Christian, a Christian figure, um, a religious figure, in this case, the God, um, St. Matthew. Um, the depiction of St. Matthew is very lively, again, because of the color choices. So again, probably referencing that cloisonade um, um, technique um, that we saw earlier. Um, the figure is portrayed in a very abstract, reductive way, just like we saw, um, again, I'll kind of circle back to some of the zoomorphic forms, the animal and human forms. So it's very interesting to see this sort of combination um, of, of these two styles, um, or not necessarily this combination of a style um, intermixing with, um, with Christian iconography um, and creating this, 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 this sort of early Christian style. Um, again, you're not responsible for this one, but I, I think it's a good one to sort of look, um, you know, and study the, you know, see how this um, transition or this sort of intermingling um, of, the, of these different worlds um, play out in art. Um, so this work shows the contact that Christians had um, with migratory tribes. Um, the work on the right is a wooden portal of a church in Norway, and so this is, um, we think, is Viking. Um, and, and, and again, they have begun to infuse some of the migratory tribe stylistic characteristics in their Christian work. So this is, um, you know, a church, but again, being influenced and using some of the decorative um, migratory um, designs um, in a Christian structure. Um, when we going, getting back to the figure of St. Matthew, the figure lacks any influence of Greco-Roman tradition. So again, this idea of anti-classical, like we saw with Byzantine, um, but in a diff, it, you know, a, again, a very different style um, that we saw in the East. Um, and again, there were definitely some echoes and references to classical Greco-Roman style with Byzantine art um, here. Um, not so much. Um, the figure of St. Matthew is an armless body formed by a pattern. So again, very, very reductive, very abstract. Um, he has rounded shoulders. He's very symmetrical. So again, if you were to sort of divide him in half, it would be a mirror image on either side. He's frontal, um, and he has these <laughs> little teeny feet in profile. So again, sort of alluding to that composite view that we studied very early on with Egyptian art and ancient Near Eastern art. I know it's hard to see. Let me zoom in a little bit too. Um, but you can also see there, you get a better idea. You know, very, you know, the face is very, very um, geometric and very stylized. And you see his hair. But again, this beautiful patterning um, and interlacing and not work um, again is that is that um, migratory influence, but um, being infused to Christian iconography. So you are responsible for this image. The, this is the Lindisfarne Gospel. This is another gospel. 
Um, this is from the Gospel of St. John, and this is called the Cross Carpet Page. Um, so we have talked a little bit about medieval manuscripts. Um, medieval manuscripts were usually produced by a team of scribes and illustrators. So these were handmade books. They were very, ex very expensive. Um, and usually the way these manuscripts worked was that they're, they would be made in a scriptorium. And so the monks um, would have different tasks or jobs. So someone might outline, someone might color in, someone might be responsible for writing the text. And so, you know, each page, it was like an assembly line, would, would be worked on and then sort of passed to the next monk. Um, and that's normally how a lot of these books were produced. Um, however, the entire Lindisfarne Gospel is supposedly the work of one man. Um, and so this is important. It gives it a, a particular sort of sense of a coherent sense of design. Um, um, according to a note added at the end of the manuscript, less than a century after its making, the artist was a monk called Aedhrith, E-A-D-F-R-I-T-H, and he was the bishop of Lindisfarne between 698 and 721. The book is a codex. It's a bound book um, made from sheets of paper or parchment from which um, he copied the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he did all four evangelists. 259 written recorded leaves. Again, the pages um, include full-page portraits of each evangelist, which we will look at in a bit. Um, we're looking at this very highly ornamental cross-carpet page. Um, and again, you can sort of understand why they're called carpet pages because they, they really do reference or look like a um, like an oriental rug. Um, each of which features a large cross set against a background of ordered yet um, this you know extravagant ornamentation. Um, the gospel the gospel themselves um, are each introduced by a historical initial, and we'll again we'll look at that too. The codex also includes 16 pages of um, canon tables set in arcades. Again, this is this is just another aspect of the book. Um, here, correlating passages from each evangelist are set side by side, enabling a reader to compare narrations. And I'm so sorry. I don't know if you can hear the weightlifting, but they're they're dropping weights. I'm recording this right now in class, so I apologize, but. I, I really can't do anything about it. So, um, apart from its intrinsic intrinsic value and remarkable survival of an ancient and astonishingly an astonishingly beautiful work, the manuscript is important because again it displays this unique combination of artistic styles that reflect a crucial period um, in particular England's history. Um, Christianity again is spreading. Um, and it first came to Britain under the Romans, but subsequent waves of invasion by non-Christian Saxon um, Angles and Vikings drove the faith to the fringes to the fringes of the British Isles. Um, the country was gradually reconverted from 597 after Saint Augustine arrived from Rome to convert the pagan Angles into angels. Um, religious differences between the indigenous Celtic church and the new Roman church um, were settled by um, the Synod, S-Y-N-O-D, of Whitby in 664. Again, just more sort of historical, um, you know, information to, to put the work into context. Um, in the manuscript, native Celtic and Anglo-Saxon elements blend with Roman and Eastern traditions to create this very unified um, vision of cultural, like a, a cultural melting pot of um, of these um, of these of these different cultures. Um, so we'll we'll take a closer look at this page. All right. So I've I've you know taken the the page and then we've kind of zoomed in. Um, so here are the aspects uh, um, or, par or parts of the picture that have been zoomed in, just so you can see how exquisite and intricate um, this work is. I mean, it, it really is crazy and must have been so time-consuming um, 
to do something like this. Um, so when we're able to look at this very up close, we see a mesmerizing series of repetitive knots and spirals. Um, and then again, it's, it's dominated by this um, central, um, centrally located cross within the composition. So if you can imagine um, a devout monk, um, the idea was that um, they would lose themselves in, in these very intricate swirls and patterning um, and color and would, you know, and that was the purpose of these pages. They, they were meant to, and for the worshiper who was, who was studying them and looking at them, not just the artist making it, but that it would kind of get um, the worshiper into this sort of meditative, um, you know, state um, by by sort of looking at all the intricacies of the pattern. Um, so compositionally, um, he stacked wine glass shapes horizontally and vertically, vertically against um, this intricate weave of knots. On closer inspection, many of these knots reveal themselves as snake-like creatures curling in and around the tubular forms, mouths clamping down on bodies, um, chameleon-like, their bodies change colors, sapphire blue, um, um, really bright green, this beautiful sort of sandy gold, um, and the color choices are extremely um, exquisite. The sanctity of the cross outlined in red with arms outstretched and pressing against the page edges stabilizes the backgrounds, um, you know, this, this activity of swirling patterns. And again, turns this sort of, turns it into this sort of repetitive energy. And, and again, it becomes a sort of um, this force of um, meditation. And actually, I'm going to kind of scroll back and see if I can zoom in to. But again, I mean, it's really hard to imagine, but um, this isn't really doing a good job. But all of this is hand done. And, and you know, there's just all these little details. And that was the idea that you would really, you know, this image of the cross, um, you would be, you would contemplate it, but then, you know, the worshiper would, would really get lost in these details. And um, this was supposed to, I guess, put the worshiper in a state of meditation and, and again, be able to connect in a more intimate way to, um, to, these, to this idea of Christianity. So again, I'm glad that here, I mean, this is just amazing. But again, this, this idea of this nodding and, and pattern and interlacing and, and color, again, if we look at this um, close up, it, it really does remind you of that cloisonnade or metalwork that we saw with um, the Hiberno-Saxon Hiberno um, um, migrant, you know, the fanny pack and the fibula that we looked at earlier. So this is an example, uh, another page from the Lindisfarne Gospel. This is supposed to be one of those um, initial pages. It's referred to as an insipid page. Um, it's the opening of the Gospel of St. Luke. So this would be sort of like the, the cover page um, of, the, of his particular Gospel. So again, we're going to kind of look at it in a little bit more detail using um, this, this cross section. So this initial of St. Luke, um, and again, this is like an incipit, I-N-C-I-P-I-T means it begins. So this is like the beginning um, page. Again, sort of teams with animal life, spiral forms, and again, this sort of swirling vortex of, of these different patterns. Um, and again, we see, um, you know, animal forms, snakes, um, we see, we see these blue pinwheel shaped, um, shapes that rotate in these sort of repetitive circles. Um, and this is all sort of in this, this is the letter U. And so, you know, it's all happening within this outline of the letter U. And, um, again, really quite extraordinary. 
Um, and so the larger Q shape that we're seeing um, is the beginning of a quote. Um, I'm not going to try to say it <laughs> um, in Latin, but I'll give you the translation. So what this would translate into is, as many have taken it in hand to set forth in order. And so you are responsible for this, um, the ones with the stars. So even like, so yeah. So this is on your 250 um, list from the AP College Board. So again, if you, you really get in closer, um, you also see um, bird shapes. Um, one knot um, enclosed in a tall rectangle on the far right unravels into a blue heron's chest snapped, um, shaped like a large um, comma. I think this is what they're talking to right here. Um, and and Edfrith, um, this is the, the bishop who made the gospel or um, produced um, this particular um, Bible, he repeats these shapes and he, you know, repeats shapes, repeats shapes vertically um, down this column. And again, he's sort of cleverly twisting. Um, and you see actual animal forms. You, right here, we see this sort of cat form. Um, so you don't notice it um, right away. But as, you know, as you were looking and studying the page in great detail, you would sort of see these, um, see these little, um, figures emerge and they're and they're really quite charming. And again, here's here's a sort of another bird that sort of um, morphs into this cat form. So again, very, very exquisite and very detailed. Um, Edrith also has added, I don't know if you can see over here, um, these really tiny red dots that sort of envelop um, the actual words. Um, so again, this is another sort of charming detail. So now we're looking, we're still looking at the Lindisfarne Gospel. We're looking at St. Luke, um, his portrait page. Um, so again, when we, we see it, when we compare it to his um, Incipit page, um, there's a there's a huge contrast. Um, you know, here the portrait is definitely more straightforward. You know, we do see some patterning, but I, definitely we don't have all this crazy knot work and um, vortex of patterns. You know, folding within you know onto each other. Um, so here we see Saint Luke. Um, he's seated. He has curly hair. Um, he's bearded. Um, and he's sitting on a red cushion stool against an unornamented background. So again, it's not all crazy with all these ornament, you know, ornamental, ornamental designs. Um, he holds a quill in his right hand and he's poised to write the words on a scroll. Um, and it's sort of kind of unfurling or coming off his lap. His feet hover above a tray supported by red legs right here. Um, and he wears a purple robe streaked with red. And um, so again, remember, purple is sort of a very imperial color. Um, and then one can, I think when you look at this, you can sort of imagine this idea of the Roman philosopher. So again, you know, there might be some throwbacks to classical art. Um, you know, definitely, you know, those are sort of hovering and, and, you know, you know, around this part of the region. And so he does sort of reference this, um, you know, uh, fourth or fifth century sort of Roman philosopher type. Um, there's a gold halo behind Luke's head, um, indicating his divinity. Above his halo flies a blue winged calf. Its two eyes turn toward the viewer with its body and profile. Um, this bovine clasps a green um, parallelogram between two forelegs, and this is supposed to be a reference to the gospel. So um, the calf, um, 
So a lot of these um, evangelists are associated with some sort of symbol, and so St. Luke is usually associated with the calf or the ox, and it's it's supposed to symbolize Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Um, other symbols that have been assigned to the other three evangelists, and, and we, we will see depictions of these um, later in other um, historical periods. Um, usually Matthew has um, a symbol of a man, um, and this is supposed to suggest the human aspect of Christ. Mark often will have the lion um, symbolizing the triumph and, and divinity of Christ um, over his um, and his resurrection. And then John has a symbol of an eagle, um, and this is supposed to refer to Christ's second coming. And so these are some symbols that we'll look at in, in other periods, and we'll de we're definitely going to be seeing other depictions and images and see how um, this Christian iconography progresses um, in later art periods. So um, our next unit um, will, will be about Romanesque art, so stay tuned.